And let's begin. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you are all doing well and having an amazing day. Uh, today we are going to continue with our lessons in uh, Mishle, looking at some of King Solomon's most deep, powerful wisdom that um, he's imparted uh, to us uh, 2,400 years ago. Um, you know, the way he wrote Proverbs was um, not like other books. He, he spent a lot of time giving these small little anecdotal ideas, some of them in metaphor, some of them in, um, some of them in allegory, but um, regardless, all of the ideas that are uh, present in Michelet are very powerful, very relevant, and super ahead of their time. Well, we believe that King Solomon was one of the uh, most intelligent men that ever lived. He had insight uh, to things that uh, you and I could only dream of beginning to understand. Um, and uh, therefore, when we read his ideas, uh, and we're trying to get appreciate you know, what he's saying, remember that even here in this class, the explanations that I'm giving are my my explanation based on the sources that I've seen. Certainly, these are not all of the ideas that are being presented um, through uh, his works, um, but I'm confident that um, together we'll walk away finding some kind of insight, some kind of very relevant, deep, powerful, profound insight in his actual writings. I did not have a source sheet for today, but if you want to at some point later uh, follow along with us, we're in the first chapter. We went through the introduction and the first seven verses. And this next piece over here goes through, let's say like verse eight through 19. Um, and he has a very interesting and very powerful way of talking about how the evil inclination works to entice us, to get us to do all sorts of things. And it's funny because, you know, I'm not sure if any of you have yet seen but on Netflix, there was a special that all my students recommended that I watch, and I did. It was something called uh, The Social Dilemma. Uh, it is a, um, a documentary of these uh, high-tech um, um, network um, and computer uh, coders and designers who help create social media and social networks. And they are concerned about the, uh, the, the ill effects of using social media. Fascinating watch. Um, they use certain techniques to, uh, and they describe this in this documentary, how, you know, social media as a tool is not just a way for you to um, make connections with people around you. A tool is something you pick up and you put down, you walk away. But these tools were designed to be super sticky and addictive. And therefore, the tools are, a, are reaching out and calling us. And the way they do this is very, very through a very, very powerful uh, manipulative tool. The other part that I love that someone made this comparison, they said that the only, in the, in, there's only two businesses where you call someone a user. In the underworld, when you're selling drugs, you're selling drugs to your users. And uh, in social media, you're calling, uh, you know, the uh, person using the social media, he's called a user also, which is an interesting uh, parallel over there. All right, let's go back and let's just jump into King Salman. So having said that, let's just be mindful of, uh, of those ideas. And we'll see how King Solomon, you know, weaves in, I'd say, some level of caution. Remember, the book of Mishle, the book of Proverbs, is here to impart wisdom. It's there, not just general wisdom. This is not a book of science. This is a book of moral character development, of spiritual development. This is a book that is there to help you um, think more profoundly about what it means to be the best version of yourself. It gives you a psychological insight into the nature of human beings. And therefore, King Solomon isn't just, you know, giving you the uh, pop science culture of the time. He was a prophet who is sharing insight into spiritual truths uh, that exist, that existed back then and, and that exist today. He revealed these ideas. Some of these ideas are basic to us because he already brought them to the world. But I think uh, when we look through them again with a uh, finer eye, we'll see the, uh, the beauty and the value in, uh, in them 
uh, today in 2020, how they're still valuable and beautiful as well. So he starts as follows, Shema b'ni Musar avicha v'al yitosh Torah imecha. Right? Hear my child, uh, the discipline of your father, the Musar of your father, and don't forsake the teachings of your mother. Right? This, is, this, this verse was made into a song. You may be familiar with it. Shema b'ni Musar avicha v'al yitosh Torah imecha. And the idea is like this. Shema b'ni Musar avicha. Who is the father in this verse, right? Musar is about is ethical teaching. Avicha, your father in this verse, according to the, most of the commentary, say that the avicha we hear is referring to God Himself. So he says like this. He says, Al titosh torat imecha. Don't forsake the teachings of your mother. What does that mean? The teachings of your mother. So, you know, we have some uh, veteran uh, scholars in this group over here. What does the word Torah mean? The Hebrew word Torah, if you were to translate it. Instruction. Very good. So the word Torah comes from the word, thank you, Leah, I think that was you, comes from the word Hora'ah. Okay, great. So the word Torah comes from the word Hora'ah, which means instruction. So he's saying, don't forsake the instructions of your mother. Right? What are the instructions of your mother? Rashi tells us that the Torah Imecha represents the fences that the sages uh, instituted to safeguard the actual commands in the Bible itself. So, so these are the additions. So it's not just that, hey, you know, follow whatever God is saying, but more than that, he's saying, hey, you know what? There's something called uh, rabbinical decrees, and they're not just there to make life unbearable, they're there to help protect and uh, create a fence so that uh, the basic laws are actually protected. So for example, you know, this is so true. Uh, on Shabbat, there's a, a law called muktzeh. It's one of the laws of Shabbat. And muktzeh means that um, an object that serves no purpose on Shabbat should not be moved, right? But if you ask any child today uh, who is uh, you know, uh, in school and learns about the laws of Shabbat, they'll tell you that muktzeh means that you can't touch an item that has no uh, use on Shabbat. Well, I just said you can't move it. Why are we teaching kids that you can't touch it? Well, a child doesn't, has a very difficult time making that distinction between being able to touch something and then and not being able to move it. So there's a safeguard that comes along and says, don't even bother uh, touching it. Don't even bother moving it. Forget about touching it. You can't even move it. You can't touch it. You can't take it anywhere. And therefore, the, the, uh, the rabbi's fences, so to speak, are there to go ahead and ensure that these ideas are preserved in any circumstance, any psychological understanding or lack of understanding. But I'd say more than that. The verse which speaks about honoring our parents, um, you know, it speaks about fearing God, right? And we know that every single human being spiritually speaking, is comprised of three parts. There's God, there's the dad, and there's the mom. The first musar, the first instruction of corrective measures that are given to us, right? We accept that of, it comes from our parents. Our parents are the ones that give us so much of our moral consciousness. They say that it's in the, in the first four or five years of our lives, of our development, our consciousness is created uh, through the voices of our parents, um, our mothers and our fathers. And therefore, think about you know, your own moral conscience. Where does that come from? It's not pre-programmed. Some of it is a, there's a, is a predisposition to some of it, but so much of it comes from your dad and your mom saying, don't do that, you're gonna get in trouble, you better listen to mom and dad. So when, you, when that happens, that, that, those yeses and no's, so those of you that have children, I, I can't tell you how important it is to um, be firm and carry through whatever it is that you tell your kids. No means no, no matter what, don't give in. Uh, yes means yes, go out of your way to reward them as much as you can, but no means no. Creating boundaries for your children is how we teach them to uh, create limits for themselves. Otherwise they become super destructive. So parents are the first ones to rebuke uh, their children, and therefore that is the, the Torah of character development. Who does that? Well, two places. One is remember that so much of who we are is a reflection of our parents admonishing us. And more importantly, as parents, we have a responsibility to create that consciousness for our children. 
Conversely, one who rejects parental musar, right, may end up also rejecting the Torah itself. And I've, I find this all the time. So many of the young people that I find that struggle with their Judaism, unfortunately, their struggle comes from or it carries over uh, from their struggle with their parents. I find this all the time. Most people who have issues with their Judaism do not have intellectual arguments that help them walk away from their Jewish beliefs. For most people, the struggle that they have with their Judaism is a uh, coming from a very deep emotional place. I have an emotional issue that I'm struggling with. I have an emotional reason why I don't want to do this. And therefore, that creates a bias and I shut myself down intellectually. Uh, I don't want to even hear your intellectual arguments. People often make that mistake. So um, parental teaching is called Musar. Um, parental teaching is called Musar. Maternal guidance is called Torah, okay? And ultimately that Torah is all about us getting to a place called Chokhmah. We want to get ourselves to a place of, uh, of wisdom. You know, um, there's no question that uh, for most dads in the relationship, he is the firm one. And most moms are the loving, soft one. So he's telling you like another, another deep insight he's sharing over here like this. He says, when it comes to the, uh, the harsh parts that we hear, that stuff should be coming from the dads. The dads should be the, one, the bad cops. Let the dads be the bad cops. Let the moms be the good cops. Now, why is that true? I think that, you know, I think that it's scarier when the dad's the bad cop. Every, everyone has their own unique relationship, you know? Um, sometimes dads want to be the good cops and sometimes mothers want to be the, the bad cop, not because they want to be, it's just because they're the ones that see everything that's happening in the house and it's so easy for them to point out, hey, you didn't put your stuff away. Hey, I asked you to do X, Y, and Z. Dads are living in a whole other planet. Like we just want to make everyone happy. But I think what he's saying over here is like this. Of course, the default setting is that most moms could easily become the admonishing voice. But he's saying something different. He's saying that dads, hello, you have to become the admonishing voice in your house. Not that you have to come down hard on your, on your children, but you should be the one to create the boundaries. They'll hear it in a different way from you because we are the playful, you know, not all dads, not all moms, but most dads are intended to be the more playful ones and so on and so forth. They're the ones that, you know, that, that ruffle the kids' feathers and get them all excited and give them to the mom to deal with their hyperactivity now and trying to get them to bed. But um, the idea over here is that the dad is supposed to create that moral voice. The mother gives this deep intellectual instruction, which means the mother has to be learned as well. I can't tell you how important this is. You know, I find that in so many families, you have you know, one person has a Jewish education, the other does not. Both of you need to have a Jewish education. Both mothers and fathers need to be learned. If we want our kids to be able to carry these ideas into the next generation, we all have, both parents have responsibility to continue their Jewish education. It's not enough to rely on the education you receive from day school. You need to constantly find places, ways, this is a medium where you could get yourself some, some wisdom, but ultimately at the very basic, I get this question, what's the most important thing I should know as a mom and as a dad? You should know Humash, you should know the story, the Bible story, exactly what is, what's going on, and who's, who's who. You should know Rashi, the commentary on the Humash itself. Those two things are the, like 90% of what you need to know to teach your kids. And then beyond that, Mishnah and Gemara, those are more sophisticated types of learnings, which the, a kid will, will probably get more from his schools. But at the very least, you got to know what the Torah says. You got to know the stories. You got to know the laws. That's just all in the text itself. I can't tell you how many Jews who love being Jewish, who are so proud uh, to carry their uh, you know, Jewish identity, but for whatever reason, they have not spent the time mastering their the book. They haven't, haven't finished the book. They don't know the book. And you know, it's, it's actually a super interesting book, especially the first book of Genesis. Genesis is like so much fun. There's so much going on there. And if you haven't had, and you haven't had any real time learning through classical text, spend the time, think of yourself as being an investigator. That's what we're doing right now. I read one verse and I've shared about, you know, 10 or 12 minutes already of information that came from one small reading of a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight word, letter, words. You know, that's what's, what's happening over here. There's so much depth over here. 
all you got to do is stop, question, and ask. Why is this? Why is that? Where is this information coming from? How do I, uh, how do I understand that? Why is he? If he could have written this in a much more simpler kind of way, why didn't he write it in a more simpler kind of way? Why was it written in this particular way? And in those questions, you get like wellsprings of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so let's keep going over here. Now he's going to give us this next, you know, six, seven verses. He's going to be giving us a very deep insight into the psychology of um, how we're able to convince people to do things that they don't want to do. And also how we can go ahead and fall into the trap or the traps of trappings of money. So listen to what he says. He says, um, Here he says, listen, he says, be careful, right? He says, the, they are an adornment of grace of your head and a chain for your neck. That's a continuation of, you know, having the wisdom from your mother and your father. They're going to help guide you. The mind is Judaism is like is the most important part of the body itself. The mind separates us from the lower parts of our body. The mind is where our senses are. He speaks over here about the adornment for your head and a chain for your neck. The neck, specifically the esophagus he's talking about over here. The esophagus has to do with your speech. If your mind is refined, then what comes out of your mind, out of your mouth will be refined. If your mind is intact, then that hakol halef acharosh everything follows the head. And therefore, if your mind and everything up here is sound and organized, then the rest of your body will align itself with the uh, organization of the mind itself. So um, he continues, and therefore, where does that come from? That comes from the study of character development and the study of the Torah itself. So he says, Bini, my child, right? If, if the sinners entice you, do not consent, right? So what are they trying, what, what are they trying to, uh, what are these sinners, who are they, and why are they trying to entice me, entice me with something? So listen to what he says. He says, if they tell you, let us go ambush and do some bloodshed, right? Let us, let us, you know, uh, lurk, for a, a moment without cause, right? So what's he saying over here? You have a bunch of guys, there's something called peer pressure, right? Peer pressure is real, okay? Uh, we don't appreciate how powerful peer pressure is. He says, if these people, these sinners, this peer pressure comes and they try to get you to do something that you don't want to do. So he makes it very extreme. He's saying, well, let's go get you to go murder, right? Now, I don't know about you, uh, but uh, if a bunch of my friends said, come, let's go out, we're going killing tonight, uh, it's not really going to entice me. I'm not interested in going out and killing anyone. You're not getting me. So what the sages say over here is that, you know, what we're talking about, death in Judaism has is very much correlated to the inability to give. Life, by definition, it means the power to give. Does anyone know why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea? So this is a spiritual answer. It's called the Dead Sea because all waters in the world give to other bodies of water, except for the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea can only receive water. It doesn't give water anywhere. It's the lowest part uh, piece of land in the planet. Okay, so all waters end there and stay there. It's called the Dead Sea because when you can no longer give in Judaism, you are considered dead. Okay, um, so um, he says that you want to come and let's go do some bloodshed. Bloodshed isn't just, um, you know, uh, murdering someone. It's about taking money away from them. Now, now let's change it around. Of course, no one wants to go ahead and kill. But let's say I told you, hey, I have a bunch of friends here. You could make a lot of money. I'm talking about millions of dollars. All you got to do, all you got to do is take this code, put it onto your computer, and uh, we'll create a phishing technique. It's not really illegal. We're not gonna take a lot of money, just a little bit, 25 cents from millions of people, no one will notice it, right? That's bloodshed in Judaism, right? You stealing money from someone is tantamount to killing them. Okay, so now that doesn't sound so best I rationalize it. So how does that rationalization happen? Two ways, one is your friends, peer pressure, and two is the enticement and the allure of cha-ching, money. Yes, the great evil, right? Why is money so tantalizing? Well, 
money is the cure to the curse of Adam, right? Adam's curse is that he has to work hard to pull his sustenance from the earth. And we're still plagued by that curse. Um, unfortunately, we still do not live, we do not live in a socialist country where we have not found a version of socialism that does work. Uh, and until we do, I'll take capitalism. A healthy, uh, clean, you know, fair, just version of capitalism, of course. And um, we're, it, it, it moves us. So many of us are just motivated to do good things and bad things just because of money. So he's saying, hey, there's this, there's this, there's a real pull here. You know, and I find it, I find it fascinating that the universities today, you know, spend so much time preparing people for a career, not to make the world a better place, not to endow wisdom, character development to their students, but instead, this is how you're going to make money. That's like the most superficial way to teach and give over anything educational and meaningful to kids today, right? It's not just about money. Right. Hopefully, you're choosing a career where you're going to make the lives of the, and, and, of the, of, and the people around you better. You're going to uplift the world around you. You're not going to bring them down. So um, he's saying there's a real thing here. There's a, there's an evil inclination that that can be very. It's very very tantalizing. It's 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 mesmerizing. And um, and if we get ourselves sucked into this world of you know money right? Um, it can get you to do some really bad things. So you have the social pressure of, oh, I want to have the money because I want to be able to do things socially. Okay, that's one hack. That's how we call it, the evil inclination. The Yitzhara gets us. This evil inclination gets us by saying, hey, it's okay. You know, you need a little bit of the money. Don't worry about it. You'll be all right. Just take a little bit over here and no one will notice and you'll be okay. And once you open up that Pandora's box, everything else starts trick the trickle down effect, right? The trickle down effect. So don't allow yourselves to be pressured by through uh, this uh, uh, peer pressure. Don't uh, get yourself lost in this pursuit of wealth and power because if you do, he says, right? He says, Kol hon nimsa, like the grave, let us swallow them alive, whole. Nimla uh, shalal. We will find our houses uh, sorry, um, yeah, nimsa, nimla batenu shalal, like those who descend into a pit. There's two kinds of pits he's referring to over here. One is an open pit or an open grave versus a closed grave. And that's the way we, we think about our financial realities. If you are someone, we're all going, there's, there's two things we all know that are certain. Number one is we're going to be paying our taxes. And number two is we're all, you know, after 120 of healthy, beautiful years of life, we end up leaving this world, right? So there's two kinds of people. There are those people that live with an open uh, grave in front of them. And there's another kind of person that lives with a closed grave in front of them. He doesn't really believe he's going anywhere. <laughs> Everything will be okay. I got all the time. I don't got to wear a mask when I'm in public. I can do whatever I want. I'm okay. I'm safe. Uh, no, we're, we're uh, very mortal human beings. And uh, we have to do everything we can to protect our lives and make sure that uh, we live a life of meaning and beauty. So how do we do that? We remember that eventually we are all going to be swallowed up. Uh, eventually the earth is going to absorb us into it. Okay, um, some people uh, recognize that and they see this notion of, you know what, there is judgment because the idea of death isn't just the finality of my life. We don't believe that that's where it ends. That's just the beginning of the journey. What makes this life so profoundly meaningful is the fact that there's death. If there was no death, there would be no meaning in life. Death brings meaning to life. But it also serves as another very important part, I think of not just meaning, but justice. That there's justice and there's a reckoning that everything that I do will be weighed. That everything, the good things that we do will be, will be rewarded for. And the bad things, God forbid, that we do we're going to be uh, punished for it. We're going to have to have an accounting for those things. So how do you see the world? Now these guys tell you, hey, don't worry about it. You know what? Um, you want to go ahead and steal with us? There's two ways that we could do that. We could split the money. Either we could go ahead and allocate a specific amount of money for you, or, or we'll share the big pot of booty. Okay? He says, my son, he's like, don't go with these people. Stay away from these people. Right, right. They, they are, they are gonna uh, just walk away from them, restrain your foot from their pathways, do whatever you can to get away. Why? He says, 
ki raglehem lerayurot, their feet are running to do evil, vim haru and they're rushing to go out. And ultimately, whatever they do, even if it's just thievery, you don't realize how many lives you're going to destroy in that pathway, how much you're going to take away from the world around you. Ki chinam mizora haroshet ki bal kanaf. For the net seems spread out with free bait in the eyes of every winged creature. So what's he saying? He's like, listen, this is, this is Google's brilliant uh, idea. You know how you get people? Make it free. If, I don't know if you remember, when, Google, when Gmail came out, the way you got a Gmail account is that someone had recommended you and you got a free account. And this was what, like in 2002, 2000, 2003, 2004 when it came out? Yeah, 2003 is when Gmail came out, around that time, 2002, 2003. Everyone wanted a free email account because back then people were paying for email accounts. But they understood if I gave it to you for free, then you know what would end up happening? I'm going to go ahead and lure you in like a, a net that has bait inside of it. And a, a bird can't, he doesn't even see the net. He just sees the bait. We're so drawn to those things. It's free, get it, take it. But we don't even, we don't realize what are those consequences of getting the bait is that we're going to get trapped. So, he says like this, wake up. When someone's offering something for free, that is usually a sign that something is wrong. I have a quick, I have a quick stock tip for you. I have an easy way for you to flip money. That should be suspicious on its own. Nothing in life that is meaningful is free. And everything in life that has meaning requires a tremendous amount of effort. So he's saying, guys, wake up. They're offering you all these free things. Stay away. And I want you to know, on college campuses, I was a rabbi on campus. I did this on campus myself. If I wanted to get my students, I wanted to lure them in, I offer them all kinds of free things. And it works. Okay? It works for good and it works for bad. You just want to hope that your kids uh, get lured in by people that are using that powerful uh, hack for good things. And everyone says, yeah, no one's, I, know, I know what they're trying to do. I know what they're trying to sell me, but... You know, it's free, so I'll figure out a way around it. Yeah, yeah. More than 80% of people that take something free, okay, have already been lured in and impacted by whatever it is they're trying to do, okay? Um, okay, so he says like this, but they wait in ambush for their blood and lurk for their souls. Such are the ways of all the spoilers they take the souls of the wealth owners. So ultimately, it's a metaphor for uh, these verses over here are a metaphor for the evil inclination. The, this is the way that we, uh, the evil doers in the world uh, hack the consciousness, uh, the moral consciousness of our minds to get us to do all kinds of bad things. So let's just review right now, okay? And we'll end with this. Um, so you have this idea that your father and your mother create your moral conscience, okay? They're the ones that help you uh, navigate between what is right and what is wrong. But King Solomon's saying, even though you have a moral conscience with all the education, right? You, uh, your, your, your dad, your parents did a great job raising you. You even went out and you learned Torah. You learned Hora. You had the instruction manual for life. With all those things, if you are confronted with a bad group of friends, who have bad intentions and they start luring you in with all kinds of these goodies, you, my friend, have to be very careful because you can get sucked into that world without even realizing that you're being sucked into the world. That's the worst kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of evil that you could be involved in where you're not even aware that you're doing a sin, right? It's one thing to know you're consciously aware you're doing something wrong, but it's even a, it's a much deeper level not, not to even be aware, it's worse. And I want to end with this one last point. You know, I had a, a family member who was uh, struggling with all kind with addiction, and um, you know, just in a very took chose a very dark path uh, for themselves. And I went to someone who I know who had a lot of experience with this, and I asked him like, "What can I do for this person?" So there's two things he said to me. One is, "Does this person want help?" And I said, "Absolutely not. They're very happy doing what they're doing." He's like, "Well, it's very difficult to help someone who doesn't want to be helped." I said, "I, I agree." And the second thing he asked me is, what kind of friends does he have? Are his friends enabling this kind of behavior? I'm like, uh, his friends are definitely doing whatever he's doing. They're doing it together as friends. He's like, then he's like, you're, you, you have to first start by getting rid of his friends. And hopefully he'll wake up and recognize that what he's doing is wrong and then reach out for help. 
but you can't, it's very difficult. I wouldn't say you can't, but it's very difficult to go ahead and move someone and help someone uh, if they don't want to be saved. Uh, and the, the example I give is like this. If, if, you, if, if you know anyone's a lifeguard, they'll tell you that if someone wants to drown, not someone who's drowning, someone who's drowning wants to be saved, but if someone is purposely going out, they want to drown, it's a danger to the lifeguard to try to save them because they're purposely pulling you down. And therefore, it's, there are scenarios where you can't go out and save someone. It could be dangerous trying to save someone, especially if they want to destroy themselves. Uh, so King Solomon is saying like this, there is this hack, social pressure. You got to be careful. Make sure your kids, uh, make sure you are surrounded by good people that are doing good things. Stay away from people that are offering you all, all kinds of easy, you know, fast track ways of making money. Those usually are a recipe for disaster. Find yourself a, uh, you know, a, a, a learning partner where you're continuously learning moral, proper, ethical behavior. And uh, if your parents did a good job, in uh, instilling a very deep sense of moral consciousness in you, you should call them after this class and just thank them. Uh, wishing you all a great night. I'm uh, looking forward to continuing this conversation, God willing, next Monday night. Just remember everyone, the new time, uh, six o'clock. Uh, God willing, next week, I'll have the source sheet for you as well. I apologize, it was last minute, a lot of changes today. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure seeing all those familiar faces. It gives me a tremendous amount of boost, especially at a time where we're so disconnected from people, but seeing those familiar faces here, it just, it definitely inspires me and helps me uh, doing uh, these kinds of things. Thank you, Rabbi. Hi, pleasure. Bye, thank you. Have a great night. Bye. So Good night. Pleasure, pleasure.